You are joining Making a Difference with Melissa Clark, a show that shares the compelling stories and voices of well-known and everyday people who change the world in big and small ways. Enjoy our guests. Call in or just listen to be inspired. For this show was made with you in mind. Please join us every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with our special guests. And you can listen to our recast at www.melissaclarkshow.com. Jr. is a Golden Globe and now seven-time Emmy-nominated actor who has devoted his life to help protect the earth. He even had his own show opposite his wife, Rochelle, on Living With Ed and on Begley Street. Thank you so much for tuning in to Making a Difference. I'm Melissa Billy Clark. When it comes to the environment, Mr. Begley goes above and beyond. Please check out his eco-friendly cleaning products on Amazon. We sat down with him to find out how we too can make a difference. His work does not go unnoticed. He will be on the cover of Preferred Health Magazine for this spring's edition. We are honored. You've been an actor for over 52 years. I, I know I'm so lucky. I actually, believe it or not, got into Screen Actors Guild 54 years ago this year. Oh, so wow. uh, I've been working that whole time and very lucky. How many people in any line of work, forget about acting, selling used cars or storm doors to work 54 years in any business, I'm, I'm just blessed. How do, you, um, how do you think the industry has changed throughout the years, Ed? It's changed in many, many different ways, not the least of which is the ease with which you can have your vision up on a screen somewhere with electronic cameras years ago, digital cameras, and now on an iPhone. People are making watchable, good movies on their iPhone or iPad. That's happening today. Sure. And, uh, you know, we used to have this elephantine equipment, you know, with sound barneys around them, something called a barney that would keep the camera quiet because cameras make noise. So all this complicated mechanical, you know, uh, equipment to pull little pieces of film through a, an aperture and have it focused, the light focused on it and chemical processes to do it. It took a lot of light and a lot of manpower and things were heavy and big. And that changed over the years. Camera, film camera equipment got smaller and smaller. And then finally digital got to the point where, you know, bl the color black was actually black and not kind of green, you know, in digital early movies. You know, things were not quite up to snuff, but now they are. You can have nearly any look you want digitally. So that was part of it. And also, you know, the independent filmmakers, that changed. It was a studio system that just decreed the way things would be. You'd be under contract as an actor, a director to a studio, and you were beholden to them in many ways. Mm. That has changed a great deal, too. So a lot has changed, and most of it for the good. It became simpler, it seems like. Yeah, it was a different day, but I was fortunate enough to see that older day, you know, things changed, of course, when we had talkies, we had sound and picture on one reel, that changed a lot, of course, and then it changed again, as I was a teenager, and then in my 20s, when the equipment started to change in lighting, just the sheer temperature of a set, you had sure. to have something called 400 foot candles of light, that's a measurement of light, to get what they call an F4, an aperture of a lens, to have good, clean focus that certain distances. So that was a lot of light. You're constantly mopping down actors and what have you and trying to keep people cool and everybody's sweating. Now yeah. you can have, literally, you can have a scene with an actual flame from one candle and you can see what's going on. And that's the way equipment and light and sensitivity have changed. Interesting. You, uh, you credit William Daniels for being your mentor, and I love him so much. You worked with him on St. Elsewhere. He's a Brooklyn guy, so I love him. I'm from Brooklyn. How important do you think it is to have someone to look up to, especially in Hollywood? I got very lucky to do a show with him and he, that he spent any time with me whatsoever. We actually became quite close, and he helped me a great deal creatively and in, in ways to survive and prosper in the business. You know, I was a big fan of his. I had seen him in a movie called Two for the Road. I'd seen him in Parallax View. I'd seen him in you know, many different films and was a great admirer of his. To, to, to get to work with him and get to know him was yeah. a great treat. And he you know, kept me on the right track you know, because I, would be, I was a man in my early 30s. So I'd be kind of you know, 
lackadaisical sometimes about preparation. He got him, no, you got to really work on these lines and have them down cold and don't be learning them in the makeup chairs we're about to shoot. Learn them the night before, Ed, for God's sake, what are you doing here? <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful influence on me to get me to take it more seriously. Mm. So I'm beholden to him and to Bonnie Bartlett and the other fine people on that show, you know, to work with Bruce Paltrow and Tom Fontana and Mark Tinker and all those great people and actors like Denzel Washington yes. and David Morris and Bonnie Bartlett and Christina Pickles, you know, great times, great times with Howie Mandel, a wonderful talent, a dear friend of mine. I, I just loved every minute of it. Was that your first uh, hit series on television? At that point, I was uh, kind of a itinerant actor that worked a fair amount, never had any starring parts or anything like that. I'd done a few interesting parts in a few movies and TV shows. But when that came along, uh, I had been working a decade and a half, and so I was well poised to take it seriously and with Bill Daniels' help to take it even more seriously and to try to do some good work. And I had six years on that show, so after that, I, I won't lie to you, life has been fairly simple. After being on a show like that, sure. for that period of time, you're kind of set in a certain way to do some form of work for the rest of your life. It could be dinner theater, what have you. It could be many things. It could be film and television. And so I've done a lot of work after that, and it's because of that show. That's awesome. I remember first discovering you uh, at the age of nine or 10 watching She-Devil. And that movie was so appealing to me because Meryl Streep, uh, she, want, she was a writer. I wanted to be a writer at that time too. And everything was pink and she was like this fairy godmother. So everything was appealing to a kid. And that's where I first saw you. Uh, you know, when people come up to you and say, hey Ed, I saw you in this and I loved you in that. How does that make you feel when people look up to you? It's extraordinary. What other line of work do you have where somebody comes up and says, I, I have a computer chip, you know, that is so good. You work at Intel, I heard. I saw your name somewhere at a bulletin board. Thank you for making that wonderful integrated circuit. It, my computer works so well. That never happens. People don't yeah. even come up that much and say, I, you know, I had a hot dog that you made and thank you so much for your great work as a hot dog vendor. Right. But to be in this line of work, to be an actor or a, to be in sports or you know, uh, to be a singer or what have you, to do live concerts, somebody like that who's in the public eye, in that, in that way, people uh, come up and they say wonderful things to you. And what a delight, what a treat that is. The, the original treat is to do the fine work for the sake of doing it, right. and to, you know, to realize the writer's dream and the director's dream and your dream as an actor, your vision. But then to get complimented for it is just gravy. It's a extreme good fortune. It's unique, I think, to that and I, sports people certainly come up to sports figures and say I love that play there in the Super Bowl you're you're wonderful yeah it's so funny that you're on my program I remember in Providence Rhode Island I think this was you did you ever go to Providence Rhode Island at the Marriott yes I did I saw you and you smiled at me I was working there at the time I had to be in my 20s and it's just so funny because you were so nice and approachable and you were just smiling away at everybody and I was knew this that in was 1998, a... by yes, any chance? Yes, yes. I went there and spoke at Rhode Island University, University of Rhode Island. Uh, J.T. Walsh was a dear friend of mine. He was to be the keynote uh, speaker, I mean, not the keynote, the uh, commencement speaker. Yeah. And uh, he sadly passed away and he was a dear friend. So his family asked me, and what an honor that was for his family to ask if I would come and give the commencement speech. And of course I did. I took the Amtrak train there and met a lot of wonderful people. And now I learn I met you. How great. That's so funny. I remember looking at you. I'm like, hey, isn't that? And then I said, yes. And then you look, you were smiling at me and you were so nice. Thank you so much for everything that you've done and all your entertainment in this, uh, in this industry. Uh, you are an environmentalist. You are amazing. You take care of the world, the earth, everything. Let's get into that. Your father inspired you to turn off lights at a young age but while leaving the room. <laughs> when did you find yourself living completely an eco-friendly uh, life? It was Earth Day 1970. It was April of 1970. At that point, I'd lived two decades, 20 years in smoggy LA. Mm -hmm. I spent a bit of time on Long Island, fortunately, with the air quality it wasn't bad at all. It was pretty good right. out on Long Island with the wind blowing across Long Island with no big mountain range to trap the heat like LA. So it was a wonderful place to grow up, Long Island. And the San Fernando, San Fernando Valley was very nice too, but the big minus 
the big challenge in the San Fernando Valley and throughout LA, throughout the basin, was a horrible, choking, debilitating smog. Sure. I mean, they would say, you can't play today. Forget about playing, just to sit on a bench and try to breathe, it hurt your lungs. So after 20 years of that, I went enough already. They're doing something called Earth Day, and they said they were gonna clean up the air and clean up the water. I went, <clears throat> you know, sign me up. Right. I'm sick of this dirty air, I wanna clean it up. Sure. I wanna, I'm sick of the dirty water near the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland and a river caught fire. You know, there was so much toxic you know, waste on the river. Somebody lit a match and the river burned. I thought that's a bad sign when rivers catch fire. Uh, that yeah. was 1969. So by 1970, people were going to clean up the water. They're going to clean up the air. And I said, I want to get involved. And I did. And I did uh, lots of things that I could afford to do. I was a broken, struggling actor. I wanted solar and stuff like that. I couldn't afford anything like that. Mm. But I did all that I could. And then here we are many years later. We have four times the cars in LA for 1970, millions more people, but a fraction of the smog. We still That's have awesome. some cleaning up to do That's through awesome. the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, shipping centers and things with diesel trucks or what have you, freeway interchanges, people in the inner city, communities of color are still suffering some bad air. But overall, the air in LA is much, much better and we need to get it all the way there. And we, it, we proved that we could do it because all the stuff we hoped would work did work catalytic converters on cars and small control devices, stationary source reduction, power plants and stuff that we cleaned up the pollution from. All the stuff we hoped would work did work. Four times the cars, millions more people, and the smog is not just the same, it's less. That's a miracle. So last year, I read up in the LA Times that California was the first state in the nation to require newly built homes to be solar powered. Is that correct? Yes, okay, that's a so very good thing that they're doing you know, uh, yeah. homes of a certain size, residential dwellings have to be, have to have solar, they have to have energy efficiency, and they're going all electric too, because you can, you know, have the electricity made from solar and wind. Mm -hmm. A lot of electricity is made by coal today, but LA buys very little of it anymore. I think we're actually off coal, or about to be off it. Very little, if any, is used for California, Southern California power at this point. Uh, for the DWP, the Department of Water and Power, that's the LA utility. But uh, we still use a fair amount of natural gas. So the thinking is to get us yeah, off the natural gas too, mm. with the challenges you have with fracking and other things with natural gas and climate change. So to get to uh, electric power and specifically clean green electric power. And I know it works. I've had solar electric on my house since 1990. Yeah. And it's run my house and charged my car. So I know it works. And I know that wind power works. I've owned a wind turbine since 1985. And I've had solar hot water in my house since 1985. So I know that all those technologies work because I've used them and they've worked for decades for me. Right. And um, you've custom designed your own home. You have a, a new home. I know that you were in a home for a long time there. And uh, you had to leave there because the daughter was getting older and your wife, uh, Rochelle, she wanted to expand a little bit more. You guys need a little bit more room. But your second home, uh, you built from uh, scratch. So I have a clip here from Rise. It was a very good interview that was done. Please take a look at the clip. Four by 10 solar hot water panels. On the back of the photovoltaic also, I have this black tubing that leads down to the pool and gives extra heat to the pool and in so doing, cools the photovoltaic panels. You want the panels to be cool, they work more efficiently. So what we have is this black tubing in the back that's heating the pool and cooling the panel. It's a twofer that works wonderfully. Here we see the nine kilowatts of solar electric before us and that's how we get nearly all of our electricity. We buy very little electricity in this efficient home. Switches are part of the Lutron system. This is kind of like the mixing panel of a sound studio. The lighting is all Lutron lighting controls and these wonderful Eaton lighting fixtures that are all LED and dimmed properly. All the shade controls work very well with that same system. One more thing I want to show you right here. We also have a system called Act On Demand that has motion sensors when you walk into the kitchen or any of the bathrooms. The motion sensor turns on a circulating pump in the basement that brings hot water to the tap. As soon as you can get to that tap handle on the hot water side and turn it on, it comes on to nice hot water very, very quickly. You're not wasting a bunch of water waiting for it to get hot at the tap. So it's a very efficient system and it works like a charm. I had never heard of that either. I thought, thought you know, is this gonna work? It works fantastic. 
If you'd like to see the full video, click on the link below. Uh, that's pretty impressive. I mean, you have, uh, you have everything there. Tell us about your home. Well, first of all, the two words I would use to describe that move from that home would be kicking and screaming. I do not <laughs> want to move. I, know. I lived in that, that house 26 years. I was kind of set in my ways. And, you know, my wife said, you know, I need more closet space and I don't want to share a bathroom with a teenager anymore. We had one bathroom. That's right. You know, so uh, eventually she wore me down. I went, okay, we'll move, but it's got to be fully green, lead platinum, highest rating. So I didn't really do any of the design, but I had my uh, solar technologies that I kind of insisted that we incorporate. And the architect was wonderful. William Hefter, this gifted architect, does a beautiful looking house. That's what my wife wanted. She wanted the aesthetic uh, you know, attributes of a house of William Hefter's. And then in the walls, hidden from view, and up on the roof, hidden from view, were all my green, like solar panels and things, you know, technologies hidden where you can't see them. So right. it looks beautiful and it's very energy efficient. It has what they call a lead platinum rating. There's silver, gold, and platinum. We right. got the platinum rating. So you have to do everything to get platinum rating. So now the good news is even though it's a larger home than I lived in for 26 years, a home I didn't want to move from, it has less energy use with water, electricity, and natural gas. So uh, there's good technology available today, but I stress, don't be put off for the things you can't afford. I couldn't afford any of this stuff when I started in 1970. I was a broken, struggling actor, but I could afford cheap and easy stuff that I did. I became a vegetarian. I started recycling. I started composting. I bought a $950 electric car, and it was cheaper to, to fuel it and to service it because of virtually non-existent service. Right. And so all that stuff I did on a budget, those same choices and many more exist today. You can become a vegetarian. It's good for the environment. You can buy energy efficient light bulbs, energy saving thermostat, weather stripping, put it up around your doors and windows, grow some fruit or vegetables in your front or backyard. Yeah. If you don't have a front or backyard, get part of a community garden. If you don't have a community garden near you, start one. There's all kinds of things you can say yes to, even on the most modest budget. So there's lots of stuff on my website at begley.com about that. So I would direct people there to get some tips. Is it cheaper to grow your own vegetables? I know that you have a big yes. uh, yard filled with vegetables. It, it can be. In my backyard, I've got six raised beds and I grow a lot of food. But early on, if you're not careful, you buy a lot of different fertilizers and you know plant foods and what have you and expensive stuff. Mm. You can have you know $7 tomatoes. So you want to be careful of that. You've got to, if you have the room and I do, you make your own compost, you collect your rainwater, you have a gray water system to irrigate the trees. So you're getting a lot of stuff that would otherwise be wasted. Rainwater in LA just goes out through the LA River, through the LA River out to the Santa Monica Bay, and right. that fresh water is wasted. Capture that water, keep it on site, irrigate your garden with it, irrigate your whole property with it. So and it's good to have emergency water buried underground too, in case uh, you know the water ever stops flowing for some reason. Yes. Are you, uh, before we get into your products, you have amazing products here that I'd like to talk about because you've saved my life with a new puppy in my house. <laughs> I love it. Thank uh, you. Are you familiar with Greta? She's a climate, she's from Sweden, I believe. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Greta. She's uh, okay. amazing. There's a great documentary on her right now. That's amazing. Yeah, she's really, she's, I think she's like 16, 17. You've also influenced people like Leonardo DiCaprio to help with the environment. Are you familiar uh, with that? I did a, a TV show with him. I'm a big friend and fan of his and mostly uh, a great admirer too, besides of his work, an admirer of his mother, Ermelin. I showed him his first electric car, I believe, but okay. his mother was of one of those wonderful green people from Germany and his father has like interest too in the environment. So I showed him a few things. I'd ride my bike to work and he was uh, impressed by that. I drove my electric car, but he, whether or not I ever met him, he was going to be with his mother, Ermelin, and his dear dad. He was going to be in a green path, I think, too. He's an incredible guy. And yeah. He's done incredible things. With, with my influence, it's one thing. I've done a fair amount, and I'm proud of it. But what he's done with his notoriety is extraordinary. Yeah, I totally agree. Big fan of him. And I'm a big fan of you in this. 
Thank this, you. Thank you so much. Uh, your people sent this over to me, so thank you so much. This is amazing. Uh, let's see. What a new puppy. This uh, pet stain removal has saved my life, and I feel safer using these products versus a product with harsh chemicals because my puppy eats everything off the floor. Off the, right. You know? So this, I love this. When did you launch these products? It was uh, a few years ago now. My dear friend Mark Cunningham and I, uh, you know, decided to have this uh, line of products. I used to have another line called Begley's Best before, and they were fine yes. products, but I got very busy with acting. I didn't have the time to run a company. I could barely, you know, run my acting career. I, I was so busy. Right. So uh, I got out of that, and then Mark said, let's do it again, but you don't have to ship anything. You don't have to store it in your garage or in a little storage space somewhere. I'll do everything. You help me promote it. We'll go to different trade shows and what have you and promote it online and in other ways. And we'll partner together and I'll do all that heavy lifting of bottling it and all of that that I was doing and storing it. So Mark Cunningham and Lab Clean have come up with this line of products cleaner than my original Begley's Best. They have wonderful EPA designed for the environment certification. And the pet products that you're showing there, the pet and odor and stain remover is wonderful. Yes. Yes. And I've got lots of other, uh, an all-purpose cleaner, you know, glass cleaner, lots of different products there, and they all work very well, and they're totally non-toxic. They're incredible products. Well, what I like, I was looking at the website. I went to BegleyBest.com, and on there, you can, not, you can see the ingredients and where the source comes from. Correct. I love that so much. That, that makes me feel very comforted. <laughs> yeah, full disclosure, and... Uh, you know, it's one thing to be green, and we, I want to have green products, but they've got to clean well. You can't just have something that's going to do a, a medium job. You want to have something mm. that cleans very aggressively. These yeah. products clean well, and they're, you know, non-toxic, safe around pets and safe around people. I really love it. I feel like I'm on QVC, but I just wanted to show the people what it looks like. And you can head thank over to, thank you, sir. Uh, thank thank you. you. You're the best. You can have his face right there too. This handsome man. You can head oh, over boy. to, <laughs> you can head over to amazon.com and uh, get all of Ed's products. Uh, they're amazing. So thank you so much for this and for saving my You're carpets. You're very kind, my dear. Thank you <laughs> thank, so much. Thank you. So you go above and beyond to help the planet. However, there are people who still litter. And that's really upsetting to me because, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, minute, I'll tell you in a minute, but what advice would you give to someone who doesn't even think about uh, throwing a piece of trash on the ground? Like, how can they start today to make a difference? You know, everybody has their way of dealing with that sort of thing, but I try not to be too uh, strident with people. I try to go, hey, maybe you didn't see that that fell here. There's a trash can over there. Can I, do you mind if I put it in? Or I try to, I take kind of a non-confrontational approach with people. And I went over a fair amount of uh, converts that way. You know, my wife is a little more direct. She'd, what are you doing? You can't let her there. I love it. And some people <laughs> react well to that and they're quite penitent and oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it or what have you. But uh, different people approach things in different ways. So I yeah. try to be very inclusive in the same way with the way I do with my diet. I would never dictate what anybody ate, what kind of house they live in or what kind of car they drive. This is what I do. Sure. And it works well for me. So if you want to join in, please feel free. And, uh, you know, I've engaged a lot of people in that way. Yeah. So if I judge people by their houses or their cars or things like that or the diet, I wouldn't have a lot of friends. So I try to be tolerant of other people and where they are in the journey and yeah. if they can make some headway. So some people go, you know, I like my hamburger, but one day a week because of you, Ed, I'm a vegetarian now. I try to eat plant-based one day a week. I go, thank you so much. That's fantastic. Sure. You know, then maybe... A little later than try two days a week, you know, and it's, it's all, we're doing the best we can, most of us. Yeah, you lead by example. You know, we're here in New York City and you see Chinese food and containers on the ground with food in it. I, I've never seen anything like it. So my father was a garbage man and he used to literally pick things up with his bare hands off the ground and put it in the trash can. And ever since he passed away, I kind of, uh, I kind of inherited that habit. Good for you. Uh, so, yeah, That's a so, good thing to do. Yeah. And if somebody sees me, maybe they'll be like, all right, they'll take a second, uh, you know, thinking and say, well, maybe I'm not going to do that because I see somebody bending over and picking something up. You know, that's, but it is my job as a human being to uh, clean up. This is our home. This is our earth. Right. And, you know, if we lead by example, I, I think that would uh, help others out. So wishful thinking. some people have the misbegotten notion that, oh, well, I'm giving somebody a job to pick it up. Uh, 
you know, that's not necessarily true. Then you have it sitting there for a while until it does maybe get picked up. Rats start to get into the food or what have you. Oh, you know, it just, it can be a problem in many ways. Some of it gets blown away by wind and what have you. Yeah. And it gets, blows, gets blown into the East River, the, you know, Hudson River or the Santa Monica Bay. And uh, so that's the best thing. And I've also eliminated as best I can single use plastic. I don't take any of that, you know, wherever I can avoid that. Yes. With the best of intentions, we actually don't recycle that much of it. It gets blown out of the recycling bins or something that people that's throw right. it on the ground and it doesn't get recycled. And so then that winds up in the waterways and turtles, you know, get straws stuck yeah. in their nose and you know, dolphins and other marine mammals think it's food and eat it and perish or get very sick. So we have to eliminate single-use plastic as best we can too, and I've, I'm doing pretty well with that. I just want to get your intake uh, on this about people putting balloons up in the air in honor of their loved ones. What's your, what's your intake on that? Because those balloons end up in the ocean. Yeah, it's, it's not for me. When I was quite yeah. young, of course, I had as a kid some balloons and later years, birthday parties. And at some point, I think in my 20s, I woke up to it, wait a minute, what is that on the ground here? I'm in the middle of a hike and I'm seeing a balloon. There's no birthday party around. And I put two and two together how that happened. It went up, the helium eventually loses its potency. It comes down and it falls into a stream and an animal thinks it's food and it eats it. Or yes. a- another big danger is those metallic, those foil, you know, those kind of foil balloons. Happy birthday, happy, happy anniversary. Yes. And those things get up there. They hit near a couple of electrical wires and they short it out because they're made of metal you know, aluminum is a metal and it crosses the circuit. It creates a circuit between two contact points and you've got a power outage because of those balloons. That's so right. there's many reasons, wildlife and, you know, and uh, safety to not get those balloons. I, I just don't get them anymore. I haven't for many years. And right. find another way to express yourself with flowers or with something, you know, some sure. sort of candy or something. I don't know, but not balloons for me. But if you want to honor somebody, just light a candle or something, you know? Exactly. Um, I know that you spoke about this before, but what can we do today in our homes to break our habits and help the environment? You don't run up Mount Everest. You get to base camp and you get acclimated and you climb as high as you can. Not everybody's going to get solar panels like me, nine kilowatts of solar. Not everybody's going to drive a fancy electric car like me. But I started small. I started with a very inexpensive electric car back in 1970. And even if you can't afford a car, Take public transportation if it's available in a year. Ride a bicycle if weather and fitness permit. Pick that low-hanging fruit first. There's an interesting list of things you can't afford to do. People say, well, I can't afford solar panels like you, an electric car. Make the more interesting list, which is things you can do. Can you buy an energy-efficient light bulb? Can you buy an energy-saving thermostat? Can you put some weather stripping around your doors and windows? Can you eat plant-based food more than you do now, maybe every day of the week when you get to it? Can you use non-toxic cleaners like the ones we sell or just vinegar and water and baking soda, you know, instead of the harsh cleanser and the other things, you know, what can you do that is cost effective? that's going to be good for the environment. So there's a long list of things I just gave. And then if you you. do well with that and you do as I did, each one of those things I did, Melissa, I saved money. I saved the environment and I saved dough because they're cheaper than the alternative. When I save some money, then I could afford a medium ticket item like a little rain barrel to collect my rainwater or a little solar oven years ago. Then I could save more money pretty soon after 25 years. Was it 1985? No, after 15 years of doing it, I could afford to put solar hot water in my house. After 15 years, 1970, this 1985, I invested in a wind turbine in the California desert to make green power. So I did the cheap and easy stuff first, do that today, Maybe one day you too can afford some the medium ticket or maybe even big ticket items. Thank you so much. And what would you like to see 20 years from now that is an easy solution to a problem that we are currently having? I wanna see more and more homes and offices that have a flat or south facing roof. This is in the Northern hemisphere, uh, a flatter south facing roof to put up solar, you know, relatively unshaded, hopefully totally unshaded. There's, that's a great amount of square footage that's available there, acres and acres, thousands of acres nationwide of flat and south facing roofs that are unshaded. So make use of that. I'd like to see solar on all of them. And with today's technology, with these wonderful 
you know, uh, battery technologies they have today. I have Tesla power walls up and yes. they're great, not just so I have backup power in case there's an earthquake or something, but they shave off the use of what they call peak power. That's power that's very expensive for the power plant to make. And also, you know, it's more environmentally damaging this peak power. So with these new power walls that I have up on the wall of my garage, I never ever buy peak power again from one to 5 p.m. Oh, wow. It's all running the meter backwards, maybe even from yesterday's solar that I had, could be a shady day and still I'm sending them power. I'm not using power from one to 5 p.m. And so that's, you know, that kind of technology is getting better and cheaper. And right now today, I can tell you with the batteries and the solar panels, you don't need to buy them as I did back in 1990. You yeah. can lease them. It'll cost you $90 a month, you know, for the solar uh, lease, but you'll save $110 a month on your electric bill. So you're putting 20 bucks in your pocket and you didn't pay a dime uh, as down payment. Yeah. You're saving 90, but it's, you know, you're saving 110, it's costing you 90. You're into the black right away. I've written a couple of how-to books, one called Living Like Ed and, uh, and Ed Begley's Guide to Sustainable Living. I've got two books on energy efficiency that address a lot of those things, and they're probably available at Amazon too. Beautiful. We'll go ahead and promote that as well. And Ed, besides leaving your legacy behind as an environmentalist and a successful actor, what else would you like to be remembered by? I'd like to be remembered uh, as being a good father and a good grandfather. And I, uh, if I have any wish for the future, I'd like to see Greta, wonderful Greta from Sweden. I'd like to see her have kids and grandkids and uh, to grow them, to raise them in a habitable world. Yes. That's what I'd really like. My kids and certainly this hero of mine, Greta, I'd like to see her have a family. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being here on Making a Difference and Making a Difference in this World. God bless you and your family. You too, Melissa. Thank yeah. you. If you have a vegan product, make your vegan claim official with the only accredited vegan trademark in the world. Visit www.beveg.com. That's www.beveg.com to apply now. Making a Difference is sponsored by Preferred Health Magazine. Please visit www.preferredhealthmagazine.com today and subscribe.